Welcome. Uh, this is uh, video number 23, lecture number 11, CFW Walther's The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. This can be purchased on Amazon, this 450-page uh, book for only $13, pretty much at cost, um, from uh, Dr. Pastor Jordan Cooper's publishing, um, publishing company. Um, but we put in the description the online version so you can follow along with that as well. Uh, with that being said, let's get, in, get into the 12th lecture of uh, the 12th evening lecture. This is video number 23, December 12th, 1884. And we're going to go until the video clicks off on me as it usually does. And that'll be part one. The worst fault in modern preaching, my dear friends, is this, that the sermons lack point and purpose. And this fault can be noticed particularly in the sermons of modern preachers who are believers. While unbelieving and fanatical preachers have quite a definite aim, pity, that is, not the right one, believing preachers as a rule imagine that they have fully discharged their office, provided what they have preached has been the Word of God. That is about as correct a view as when a ranger imagines he has discharged his office by uh, sailing forth with his loaded gun and discharging it into a forest, or as when an artilleryman thinks he has done his duty by taking up his position with his cannon in line of battle and by discharging his cannon. Just as poor rangers and soldiers, as these latter are, just so poor and useless preachers are, those who have no plan in mind and take no aim when they are preaching. Granted, their sermons contain beautiful thoughts. They do not, for that matter, take effect. They may occasionally make, uh, they may occasionally make the thunders of the law roll in their sermons, yet there is no lightning that strikes. Again, they may water the garden assigned to them with the uh, waters of the gospel, but they are pouring water on the beds in the pass of gardens, in the pass of the garden indiscriminately, and their labor is lost. Neither Christ nor the holy apostles preached in that fashion. When they had finished preaching, every hearer knew he meant me. Even when the sermon had contained no personal hints or insinuations, for instance, when our Lord Jesus delivered the powerful and awful parable of the murderous vine dressers, the high priests and scribes confessed to themselves he means us. When the holy apostles Paul, on a certain occasion, had preached before the unjust governor Felix concerning righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come, Felix perceived immediately that Paul was aiming his words at him. He trembled, but being unwilling to be converted, he said to Paul, Go thy way for thy time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. But he never did call him. He had heard the sermon suited to his spiritual condition, and Paul's well-aimed remark, remarks had struck home. The reason then, my dear friends, why in the Lutheran congregations of our former home, home country, Germany, unbelieving preachers are nearly always in the ascendancy is unquestionably this. The sermons of the Christian preachers are aimless, are aimless efforts. Unbelievers are increasing in the congregations about as fast as the Christian preachers are increasing, of whom are considerably more now, sorry, than when I was young. Why do they accomplish nothing? Oh, would to God that these dear men had the humi humility to sit down at Luther's feet and study his apostles. They would learn how to preach effectively. For the word of God, when preached as it should be, never returns void. May God help you in your future ministry, not, be, not to become aimless prattles, so that you will have to complain that you have accomplished so little when nobody but yourselves is at fault because you have no definite aim when preparing your sermons 
and do not reflect, to such and such a people I want to drive home a lesson. Not this or that person whom I am going to name, but persons in whose condition I know to be such and such. However, however, while it is important that your sermons do not lack a special aim, it is equally important that your aim be the right one. If you do not aim properly, your preaching, after all, will be useless, whether you preach the law or the gospel. Thesis number eight. In the fourth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror in account of their sins or the gospel to those who live secretly in their sins. In the opening lecture on our, seri on our series of these, we got acquainted with six points of difference between law and the gospel. They differ, one, as regards the manner of their being revealed to men. Second, as regards their contents. Third, as regards the promises held out by either doctrine. Four, as regards to their threatenings. Five, as regards the function, the effect of either doctrine. Six, as regards the persons to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. As a rule, point six is named last. The reason is not that it is less important, for this point introduces a, dif a difference of especially great importance. It is this. The gospel must be preached not only to bruised, contrite, miserable sinners, the law to secure sinners. Inverting this order means confounding both, and by confounding them, commingling both the most, in the most dangerous manner. Of the truth of this, we become convinced in, the, in our first, le first lecture from the statement in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 8 through 10. We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, and profane, for murder murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Unquote. No law is given to a person who is made righteous by Christ. But but to the unrighteous and disobedient. These are the persons to whom the law must be preached to make a miserable, contrite sinner the subject of law preaching is to commit a grievous sin against him, for the gospel ought to be preached to him. Isaiah says, chapter 61, 1 through 3, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the phrase day of vengeance does not signify a day of judgment on men, for to proclaim such a day would be not proclaiming an acceptable year, the meaning is this, the Son of God meant to take vengeance on Satan, who had hurled the human race into misery. For this reason, the proclamation of the day of vengeance is cheering, comforting message to us. If God had not avenged our fall on, on, upon Satan, we should be lost. If Christ had not redeemed us from the devil, we could not rejoice, but would have to remain in sadness. The picturesque phrases which follow in this text must all be understood figuratively as pointing to spiritual gifts of grace. These texts show us that according to God's word, not a drop of evangelical consolation is to be brought to those who are still living securely in their sins. On the other hand, on the other hand, to the brokenhearted, not a syllable containing a threat or rebuke is to be addressed, but only promises 
That's gospel. Promises conveying consolation and grace, forgiveness of sin and righteousness, life and salvation. Law, gospel. Law, promises. That was the practice of our Lord and Savior. One day he was approached by a woman, with, quote, which was a sinner, Luke 7, 37, who in the presence of a self-righteous Pharisee knelt down, washed his feet with her hot tears and dried them with the, dried them with her hair, with which in former days, no doubt, she had fre frequently made a display of vanity. She was crushed when she came to Jesus. There was no one to comfort her, but she turned to Jesus, for she had realized that where he was, there was the throne of grace. What did the Lord do on that occasion? What did the Lord do on that occasion? He did not utter one word of reproof because of the sins she had committed in darkness, for she had no doubt lived in the worst sins of fornication. No, not a word. He simply said to her, Thy sins are forgiven. In another, a similar instance, he dismissed the guilty woman with the assurance, Neither do I condemn thee. And with the brief admon admonition, admonition, Go and sin no more. This is how Jesus, law and gospel, how he used it in certain instances. Those that were broken by the law, he didn't. They, they don't. They don't need more law. They need gospel. If they're not broken by the law, they need law to break them. This is what Walter's getting at. The same treatment the Lord, uh, the Lord accorded to Zacchaeus, the nefarious publican who had defrauded people throughout the land. He may have heard some things from Christ directly and many more things from the report of others. He had gained the conviction that he would not go on in his sinful ways, but must amend his conduct. When the Lord was about to pass in the neighborhood, he mounted a sycamore tree because he wanted to see the holy man. What did the Lord do? Catching sight of him in the tree, he called him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus surely expected that the Lord would go over the record of his sins with him and hold, hold up to him all the evil he had done. But Jesus did nothing of this kind. On the contrary, in the house of Zacchaeus, he said, quote, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. It is Zacchaeus who says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from my uh, from a man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. The Lord did not demand this of him, but by his own conscience, first alarmed, but now quieted, demanded this joyful act of generosity to the poor from him. No doubt he kept his promise. Just give me a second here. The parable, the parable of the prodigal is another illustration. The Lord pictures him to us after he, after he had wasted everything he had with harlots as returning to his father with a contrite heart. The father receives him without a word of censor, but falls upon his neck, kisses him, and exclaims, Let us be merry, for, the, for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. A joyous banquet is prepared, but not a word of reproof is spoken. This attitude the Lord maintains even while hanging on the cross. Next to him hangs one who has led an infamous life. The patient suffering of Christ has given him a new understanding, which he voices in these words We indeed are justly. In this condemnation, for we receive the due reward for our sins. But this man has done nothing amiss. Turning finally to the Lord, he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. He recognizes in Jesus, the Messiah, and now observes that the Lord does not reply, What? Thee I am to remember? 
thee who has done so many wicked things. No, he does not cast up sins to him at all, but simply says, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. But these incidents the Lord shows. Well, the sun's going down, so we'll open up the blinds a bit here. Get some light in here. Okay. By these incidents, the Lord shows us what we are to do, even today. For a poor sinner who may have led a shameful life, but has become crushed and contrite, full of terror because of his sins, in such a case we should not lose any time in censoring and reproving him, but absolve and comfort him. This is the way to divide gospel and the law. The practice of the holy apostles was identical with that of the Lord. You will recall the incident of the jailer at Philippi. He was on the point of committing a shocking deed. The mortal sin of suicide. When Paul called to him, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. All through the night he had heard Paul and Silas singing praises to God. No doubt a new knowledge had begun to dawn on him. When he had heard Paul warning, Paul's warning cry, he called for a light. Came trembling and fallen down before Paul and Silas said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? They did not tell him of a number of things that, that he will have to do first, for instance, to feel contrite. They simply say to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shall be saved in thy house. They simply invite him to accept the mercy of God, for that is what faith is accepting the divine mercy or grace. Let me now cite you from cite you from Luther's writings. Not so much passages in which he insists that the gospel, pure and uh, unannoyed, must be proclaimed to poor sinners, but rather a particular incident which illustrates how Luther brought consolation to a person who had fallen into a great grievous sin. Get a drink of water here. The party in question was a splendid man of Spel Spelatin, born 1482, with a great share in the work of the Reformation. He became ecclesiastical counselor to the elector of Saxony and lived in Altenburg. He was Luther's intimate friend. He had been party to, a, to an advice given to a certain pastor to marry the stepmother of his deceased wife. The marriage was absolutely contrary to God's word, and the advice was the, advice was the more appalling since the Apostle Paul, in dealing with a similar offense in 1 Corinthians 5, had declared that, it involved fornication, such was not so much as named among the Gentiles. When the truth dawned on good Spolatin, he refused to be comforted. Luther learned that he had fallen into melancholy. No comfort offered him would take effect. He imagined that no consolation of Scripture could apply to a man like him who had known the word of God so well and had derived so much consolation from it. How did Luther proceed to comfort this man? He wrote him a letter, which be began as follows, quote, Grace and peace from God in Christ and the consolations of the Holy Spirit to my worthy master in Christ, George Spallington, superintendent of the churches in uh, Misnia, most faithful pastor of Altenburg, my beloved in the Lord, amen. My dearest Bulletin, I heartily sympathize with you and earnestly pray our Lord Jesus Christ to strengthen you and give you a cheerful heart. I should like to know in making diligent inquiries to find out what your trouble may be 
or what has caused your breakdown. I am told by some that it is nothing else than depression and heaviness of heart caused by the matrimonial affair of a person who was publicly united in marriage to the stepmother of the deceased, deceased wife. If this is true, I beseech you most urgently not to become self-centered and heed the thoughts and sensations of your own heart, but to listen to me, my dear brother, who is speaking to you in the name of Christ. Other, you know, otherwise your despondency will grow beyond endurance and kill you. For St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, The sorrow of the world worketh death. I have often passed through the same experience and witnessed the same. Or, uh, I think that's the end of the quote there. We'll see. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of the quote. We'll it'll pick it up in a second here. I have passed through, this is Walter speaking now, I have passed, I have often passed through this same experience and witnessed the same in 1540 in the case of, no, th this would be Luther speaking, sorry. The sorrow of the world worketh death, 2 Corinthians 7.10. I have often passed through the same experience and witnessed the same in 1540 in the case of Magister Philip, who was nearly consumed by heaviness of heart and de despondency on account of the Landgraves affair. However, Christ used my tongue to raise him up again. I say this on the supposition that you have sinned and are partly to blame for the affer aforementioned marriage because you approved it. End quote. Observe that Luther grants that Spolatin had committed a grievous wrong by approving the marriage, by advising in favor of it before it was contracted. Luther proceeds, Yea, I shall go further and say, even if you had committed more numerous and grievous sins in this present and other instances, then... Uh, oh, Manasseh, king of Judah, whose offenses and crimes could not be eradicated throughout his posterity, down to the time when Jerusalem was destroyed, while your offenses is very... While your offense is very light, because it concerns a temporal interest and can be easily remedied, nevertheless I repeat it. Granted, you are, you are to blame. You are going to worry yourself to death over it, and by thus killing yourself, commit a still more horrible sin against God? End quote. Luther means to say, this marriage can be dissolved. For it is not legitimate. It would be a greater sin now to despair of the mercy of God than it was than it was to advise this marriage. For despairing God's mercy is always the most horrible sin, because it means that we declare God to be a liar. Luther goes on. It is bad enough to know that you made a mistake in this matter. Now do not let your sin stick in your mind, but get rid of it. Quit your despondency, which is far greater, which is a far greater sin. Listen to the bl blessed consolation the Lord offers to you through the prophet Ezekiel, who says in chapter 33, verse 11, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Do you imagine only in your case the Lord's hand is shortened? Isaiah 59, 1. Or has he, or has he in your case alone forgotten to be gracious and shut up his tender mercies? Psalm seventy-seven ten. Or are you the first man to ag aggravate his sin so awfully that henceforth there is no longer a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of her infirmities? Hebrews four fifteen. Do you consider it a new marvel when a person living this life in the flesh with a new innumerable arrows of so many devils flying about him is occasionally wounded and laid prostrate? Luther means to say, why are you surprised at your grievous fall? That is a common occurrence. The terrible part is only when we refuse to rise again like miserable reprobates crawl back to the throne of grace. Luther continues, quote, it seems to me, my dear Spallington, that you have still but a limited experience in battle and against sin, an evil conscience, the law, 
and the terrors of death, where Satan has removed from you your vision and memory, every consolation which you have read in the scriptures. In days when you were not afflicted, you were well fortified, and knew very well what the office and benefits of Christ are. To be sure, the devil has now plucked from your heart all the beautiful Christian sermons concerning the grace and mercy of God in Christ, but which you used to teach and admonish and comfort others with a cheerful spirit and a great buoyant courage, or it must surely be that heretofore you have been only a trifling sinner, conscience only of paltry and insignificant faults and frailties. End quote. There are only two ways to which Luther can explain to himself why Spolatin refuses to be comforted. Either he has hitherto failed to perceive his mercy and wretchedness under sin. He has not been aware of the fact that he is a great sinner by nature. His grievous fall has to occur in order that his eyes might, might be opened to these facts. Or Satan must have hidden every consolation out of Spolatin's sight. Practically, practically Luther says to Spolatin, had you fully realized the awful corruption of your heart in its relation to God, you would not be so in, inconsolable. For you would, you would say to yourself, Alas, the fountain is so polluted, that is why such filth has to flow from it. To return to Luther, quote, Therefore, my faithful request and admonition is that you join our company and associate with us who are real, great, and hard-boiled sinners. You must by no means make Christ to seem paltry and trifling to us, though he could be our helper only when we want to be rid, of, be rid from imaginary, nominable, and childish sins. No, no, that would not be good for us. He must rather be a savior and redeemer from real, great, grievous, and damnable transgressions and iniquities, yea, from the greatest and the most shocking sins, to be brief from all sins added together in grand total. End quote. To the company of the real and great abominable sinners to which Spalton is invited, Luther feels that he belongs himself. He argues that by making our sin small, we make Christ small. That would practically amount of saying Christ can forgive small, but not great sins. When a person has com committed a great sin and is unconcerned about it, he is beyond help. But when the worries about it, his help has already come. Luther relates, quote, Dr. Stoppit, Stoppit, uh, German name, uh, I know that name, I should know that name. Dr. St Stoppit comforted me on a certain occasion when I was a patient in the same hospital and suffering the same affliction as you by addressing me thus. Aha, you want to be a painted sinner and accordingly, except to have in Christ a painted Savior. You'll have to get used to the belief that Christ is a real Savior and you are a real sinner. For God is neither jesting nor dealing in imaginary affairs. But he, had, but he was greatly and most assuredly in earnest when he had sent his own son into the world and sacrificed him for our sakes. Romans 8, 32, John 3, 16. These and similar reflections drawn from the consultory Bible texts have been snatched from your memory by the accursed Satan, and hence you cannot recall them in your present great anguish and despondency. For God's sake... Then turn your ears hither, brother, and hear me cheerfully singing. Me, your brother, who at this time is not afflicted with the despondency and melancholy that is oppressing you, and therefore is strong in faith, so that you, who are weak and harried and harassed by the devil, can lean on him for support until you have regained your old strength, can bid defiance to the devil and cheerfully sing, Thou hast thrust sore at me, that I might fall, but the Lord help me. 
Psalm 118, verse 13. Imagine now that I am Peter holding out my hand to you and saying to you, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk, Acts 3. For I know that I am not mistaken, nor is the devil talking through me, but since I am laying the word of Christ before you, it is Christ who speaks to you through me and bids you obey and trust your brother who is of the same household of faith. It is Christ that absolves you from this and all your sins. I am a partaker of your sin by helping you to bear up under it. End quote. On the occasion to which Luther refers, he had gone to Dr. Stoppitz to pour out a sorrowful heart to him. He had not committed any gross and, and manifest sins, but he was worried over the sinful condition of his heart. God had granted Luther an extraordinary measure of knowledge that made him understand the corruption of human nature. His remark about a painted Savior is striking. If we do not want such a Savior, we must not be surprised when we discover ourselves to be real, actual sinners. Luther's appeal to Spolatin to receive him, uh, not for his person's sake, but because he is laying the word of God before him, is a fine touch. Spolatin is to see Christ standing before him and speaking to him in the person of Luther. Also, the remark about Luther sharing Spolatin's sin by helping him bear his burden is excellent. When a minister absolves a person who has confessed his sin to him, he takes that sin of the other on his own conscience. He can cheerfully do this for the party that came to him to confess. Perhaps the most horrible sins, sins came with a bruised heart. He may cheerfully pronounce absolution to such a person and say, I shall assume the responsibility for what I am doing. For I know that on the great day of judgment, Christ will say to me, you did right, for he came to you with a bruised conscience, and it was proper that you ministered the gospel to him. Luther concludes his letter with these urgent remarks. See that you will accept and appropriate to yourself the comfort, comfort I am offering you, for it is true, certain, and reliable, since the Lord has commanded me to communicate it to you and bidden you to accept it from me. For even I am cut to the quick by seeing you in such awful distress because of your deep melancholy. It gives God a far greater displeasure to behold it. For, quote, he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. Joel 2.13 Therefore do not turn away from him who is coming to comfort you, and to announce the will of God to you, and who hates and admonishes your despondency and melancholy as a plague of Satan. Do not by any means permit the devil to portray Christ to you differently from what he is in truth. Believe the scripture, which testifies that, quote, he was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Melancholy is a work of the devil, which Christ wants to destroy. If you will only let him uh, you have had your fill of anguish. You have sorrowed enough. You have exceeded your penance. Therefore, do not refuse. Therefore, do not refuse my consolation. Let me help you. Behold my faithful heart, dear Spolatin. In dealing with you and speaking to you, I shall consider it the greatest favor that I have ever received from you, if you allow the comfort which I am offering you, or rather the absolution, pardon, and restoration of the Lord Christ to abide in you. If you do this, you will, after your recovery, be forced to confess yourself that you have offered the most pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to the Lord by your obedience. For Psalm 147, 11, it is written, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and in those who hope in his mercy again. In Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is nigh unto, unto them that are of broken heart and saveth such 
of a contrite spirit. In Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices of God are of a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that willeth not despise. Therefore, let the accursed devil with his despondency scamper away like a whipped dog. He wants to make me sad on your account. He wants to blast my joy in the Lord. Yea, if he could, he would swallow us all up with one gulp. May Christ our Lord rebuke and chastise him, and may strength, comfort, preserve you by his Spirit. Amen. Comfort your wife with, with these in your own more effectual words. I have not the leisure to write also to her, given at Zecht, August 21st, uh, AD 1544. Your Martin Luther. Luther argues that sharing a brother's sin entitles you to claim that the brother must in turn share your comfort. God takes no pleasure in beholding a person stricken with remorse and laboring with his might in main, in main to remain this stricken. When the hammer, when the hammer, when the hammer of the law, When the hammer of his law has crushed us, we are to flee from Moses to Christ. When the hammer of his law has crushed us, we are to flee from Moses, the law, to Christ. Gospel promises. That is the right procedure. Luther's exegesis of 1 John 3, or 1 John 3, 8 is beautiful. The term works of the devil is commonly interpreted to signify horrible and gross sins. But Luther compromises compromises in that term also doubt and melancholy as being the most grievous sin. Christ did not come to fill us with sadness, but with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Luther wrote this letter to Spalatin while stopping during her journey at Zeitz, German name, German town. I take it. The only thanks which he craves for the task of composing this letter, no doubt, with the heartful signs of to God, is that Spalatin accept his consolations. I wanted to communicate this letter to you in its entirely, hoping that it might that it may have pleased you so much that you would often read it again. Think of it particularly particularly whenever a sorrowing disconsolate sinner approaches you in your pastoral capacity. Read this letter as a preparation for the evangelical treatment which you are to accord such a sinner. Remember, Luther admits that Spalatin had sinned, but that he realized that he had, at the particular moment, he must not, for God's sake, say anything to Spalatin that might strike his friend's heart like an arrow. Let me read another letter to you, which Luther wrote as far back as 1516 to the Augustinian friar Spenlin, who was in great agony concerning his state of grace. Spenlin had been an inmate while Luther in the Augustinian monastery at Wittenberg with Luther. In the judgment of all who are familiar with Luther's writings, this letter is most excellent. One marvels that Luther could write such a letter even at that early date. It is sterling good gold it is sterling gold and pure honey. I wish to know, Luther writes, the condition of your heart, whether you have at last come to loathe your own righteousness and desire to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ and to be of good cheer because of it, for in these days the temptation to presumptive the days, the to temptation to presupposition, pres, no, uh, presumptuous is very strong, particularly in those who strive with might and main to be righteous and godly and do not know of altogether immaculate righteousness of God, which is freely given us in Christ. As a result of this, they are searching for something good in themselves, good in themselves. In justification, it's outward. There's nothing good good in us. There's nothing 
good in us when we're un unregenerate. Not at all. As a result of this, they're searching for something good in themselves until they become confident that they can pass master before God as people who are properly adorned with virtuous and meritorious deeds, all of which is impossible. While you were with us, you held this opinion, or rather this air, just as I did. For my part, I am still wrestling with this air, and I'm not quite rid of it yet. Therefore, my dear brother, learn Christ, Christ crucified. Learn to sing praises to him, and to despair utterly of your own works. Say to him, Lord, or thou, my Lord Jesus Christ, art my righteousness. I am thy sin. Thou hast taken from me what is mine, and hast given to me what is thine. Thou didst become what thou wert not, madest me to what I was not. The Great Exchange. This is 1516, before the, before the Reformation, Luther was starting to get it. Beware of your ceaseless striving after righteousness so great that you no longer appear as a sinner in your own eyes, you do, do not want to be a sinner, for, for Christ dwells only in sinners. He came down from heaven where he dwelt in the righteous, for the, for the very purpose of dwelling in sinners also. Ponder this love of his, and you will realize his sweetness, sweetest consolation, for we must achieve rest of conscience by our own toil and worry. For what purpose did he die? Therefore you are to find peace in him by a hearty despair of yourself and your own works. And now he has received you, made your sins his, and his righteousness yours. Learn also from him firmly to believe, as behooves us, be behooves you, for cursed is everyone who does not believe this. We note that Luther tells Spenlin not to be surprised when he finds nothing meritorious in himself, but only sin. He must learn to sing praises to Christ and to, and to despair of himself as of a person in whom nothing good is found, except what the good God has done through him. He is not to strive after righteousness of his own, which would make him seem no longer a sinner, for in one that knows what God's word says about this matter, that would be an impundent denial of his Redeemer, the remark, the remark of Luther that Christ was only in sinners. Wal Wallace, the, et the editor of Luther's works, has anointed uh, by a gloss that the, limit, the limits Luther's remark to poor sinners. That is self-evident. Bold sinners do not acknowledge that they are sinners. What others call sin, they call human weakness and natural, inborn dis disposition. Their occasion occasional display of godliness is sheer hypocrisy. They may say we are such poor sinners, but they do not mean that statement in the scriptural sense. They say, well, we cannot help being weak mortals. But one is a drunkard, another a fornicator, the third a thief, etc. All these vices are to pass for mere weakness. Verily Christ dwells only in sinners who are such in their own estimation. He had dwelt among the angels, but came down on earth because he wanted to make his abode also with sinners. Luther's surprise query, why then did Christ die, is an excellent point. Anyone who is troubled on account of his sins is a fool for not promptly taking refuge with Christ and for imagining that his evil conscience is proof that he has not come to God. No, this is what the evil conscience states. You should come to Jesus. He will give you cheerful conscience, causing you to praise God with a joyful heart when you rise in the morning and lie down to rest at night. For what does it mean that Christ died for you? Accordingly, when you have committed this, that or the other sin, and are perplexed about a way out of your sin, do you not try to make a way for yourself? Go to him, who alone knows a way. Go to Christ. 
It is a remarkable statement of Luther, but certainly true, that we are to find peace by holy despair of our own good works. When a poor sinner regards himself, he also he does despair. When he looks at Jesus, he is made confident. What Luther wrote to Spenlin is the most beautiful gospel that can be preached, for it declares that Christ has came had come in behalf of everybody, that he had borne every man's sin, that he calls on everyone to believe in him, to rejoice and rest assured that his sins are forgiven, and that in the hour of death he will depart saved. So we got through that whole 12th lecture in one reading.